Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the family hist the BYU Family History Library Sunday class series. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that these classes are recorded and put up on the BYU uh, archive of all of the classes on the BYU Family History Library website, which is part of the Brigham Young University website. It's, they are also posted to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. And that is, of course, open and free to the whole world also. And uh, I just noticed that we went over a million views on the YouTube channel for our videos, and we have over 600 videos. So it's getting to be quite a, a resource. It was a resource all along, but it's now it's a bigger resource. So now we are going to also remind everyone that there is a virtual desk at the BYU Family History Library. Uh, you can go to the BYU Family History Library website. At, up in the right-hand corner of the startup page, you'll see a link to the virtual help desk. And during the hours of, that the uh, missionaries are there, which are posted, and on the days they are there, except for the holidays and everything else that goes on at BYU, uh, we will be available for answering questions directly uh, and have the resources of our missionaries, all of, almost, well, about 100 missionaries that could uh, provide help and resources. Okay, so today, because of the Thanksgiving season, we're going to talk about uh, Thanksgiving and uh, We'll get started here. I uh, guess the first question that always comes up is why is this called the Great Migration or what is the Great Migration? And uh, that uh, comes about as a fact that uh, very few people, uh, if, if you went through a normal history class at uh, uh, about American history in high school or even, a, even most of the courses at the university level, you would probably uh, have heard about the Pilgrims and the Mayflower and maybe uh, uh, some of Jamestown and some of the other places that uh, are uh, uh, kind of prominent in the early uh, settlement of the, of the Americas by Europeans from England and probably very little else. <laughs> because that uh, it just is not what you would call a lot of good of, of uh, interesting news. The interesting news was that people started coming here from, the, from Great Britain and uh, that was the news. And you could say that in one sentence. Why are we interested in the great migration? Well, first of all, there are two great migrations then we need to separate those out. The first one that we call the migration to New England from 1620 to about 1640 is significant. And we'll talk more about why it's significant to genealogists in a very, very practical way. And the second great migration is that of African-Americans from the South to the North that began approximately during World War One and dates back actually until the 1800s, but began, uh, kept going until well over 6 million uh, African-American people had left the South to live in Northern and Western cities. And it changed the entire demographics of the United States. So both of these migrations are uh, significant in the way that they had impact on the population and the culture of the United States. So this presentation is going to focus on the great migration from 1620 to 1640. And in order to uh, make this not uh, any kind of a suspense or mystery or anything else, uh, basic reason for this is simple. Uh, there was a, uh, a huge number of people that came to uh, the American continent uh, from England and from the other British countries during this time period. And as we'll talk about in just a few minutes, uh, as far as the records have been able to be uh, available and they are available to the people who did this, 
there are it, it is uh, there is a list of every single person, man, woman, and child, who came to America between those two periods from 1620 to 1640. An exhaustive, complete list. Okay, so just think about that as we get going here, so we can uh, begin to understand why this is such a, a an impact. Um, <clears throat> kind of a an explanation because there's two words here that that need to be defined because they're they sound almost identical, and if you say them both fast, they sound the same. Immigration, immigration, I am, is the action of coming to live permanently in a foreign country. So someone comes to a country that is not their country, meaning their native country where they were born, uh, then they are called an immigrant. Emigration, with an E, is leaving the country of one's own country to settle. Now, why is this important? It's because there are two sets of, of records that are created. In the countries of arrival, the, Im the immigrant are immigration records. In the countries that had people leave, there are emigration records. There are records showing that they left the country. And hopefully when you're doing your research, you'll be able to match those two up and say, oh, well, this person, my ancestor, was an immigrant into America in whatever year, and they left England at this time. And here is the record of them leaving, and here is the record of them arriving. That is just one major step in identifying Im the immigrants. So that's the difference between those two particular topics. There are an estimated there are estimates that 35 million people have Mayflower ancestors. That means of the 50, around 50 people who survived the first year of the, of the voyage of the Mayflower in, in America uh, had descendants. And of those descendants, there are now approximately 35 million, probably a lot more, 35 million people of the Mayflower. But for the rest of the, of the great migration, uh, the number is 20,000 people came in that time period. And of those 20,000 people, you can imagine that there is that practically a lot of people, probably hundreds of, of millions of people in the United States are uh, related to uh, directly to these, these immigrants who came to America. Um, there's there's an easy way to tell whether you are, and that is to do your research back and see if any of your family came from New England. If any of your family came from New England, there's a, uh, a pretty high uh, chance that they arrived uh, during that early time period. And if not, um, there's probably some part of your family that intermarried with those people. So uh, as you keep tracking back on, in, on New England lines, you're your chances of running into the Mayflower or into uh, the great migration people is fairly substantial. So if you have ancestors from New England, just, just think this, it's very likely that some of them were in the great migration. Sometimes we say, well, maybe they're descendants of this person or that person. Uh, the chances of that are far, are, are almost, you know, sometimes extremely remote, uh, particularly if it's just a matter of you have the same uh, surname as somebody like Daniel Boone or, or uh, President Lincoln or somebody like that. But uh, in the, as, it, as it comes out, it's something like this with the Great Migration, the impact was as tremendous because there, as I've already mentioned, there's huge numbers of people. So this is a this is a significant uh, opportunity for people to do some research. The Great Migration mainly involved people who were known as Puritans, and another name for them was separatists. Plus, as I mentioned, as I see down there at the bottom, a lot of land developers and speculators. Um, it was, 
the people who were who were not part of the religious sects who came to America and they weren't all uniformly the same religious background, but the predominant ones who came early on were were um, what we what were ultimately called Congregationalists. And the others, the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the uh, other and the people who were not Christians, such as the Jewish people and the uh, and any others who came, the slaves eventually, the uh, enslaved people who were brought to America, all of those people uh, did not weren't in the same religion as the Puritans or the Separatists. And to think that um, there was anything, let's say, call it unique about the way that they, uh, the reasons that they came and why they were here uh, was not, is not very difficult to understand once you get back into a little bit of English history. The main issue was, of course, that there was uh, extreme persecution of people who were separate, separatists, who had separated from the, the, uh, the ch national church, the Church of England. And in, the, in Scotland, there was a Church of Scotland. And in Ireland, there was a Church of Ireland. And so, it, and there was a Church of Wales. Uh, each of the countries had their own uh, state religion and did not, uh, look well on and during most of the time period back there in the 1600s did not look well on anyone who was not a member or claimed not to be a member of their church and uh, as we know about the pilgrims they uh, the mayflower passengers they had a uh, rather secret they just uh, had a different route to get to america most of them left england to live in the netherlands and then later after having been in the Netherlands for a number of years, enough time for people to, uh, to uh, have families and, and uh, children and, and whatever in the Netherlands, they decided as a group to move to America. And that's how uh, the Mayflower people got here. And if you're thinking in terms of what I just said, you may understand that some of the Mayflower passengers uh, the descendants of the Mayflower passengers are descendants of people whose uh, native country was the Netherlands or Belgium. So there's uh, a little bit of complication here when you start thinking about the, the Mayflower people as being somehow uh, completely unique from the rest of the people who in the United States are descendant from uh, lots of different parts of the world. So they were, there's other names, they were called independents, and they are the English Protestants in the 16th and 17th century. And they had a perceived, uh, there was a perceived corruption of the Church of England, and they wanted to form their own local church, churches. And as it says here, they were labeled as traitors, and uh, they left. And coming to America was kind of the ultimate issue, because uh, there was no government here officially at that time because there were no European, uh, English speaking Europeans here in, in America at that time, except for a few traders and others who had come earlier and explorers, whatever, who had come earlier. So these were the, some of the earliest um, uh, settlements. The other settlements were in Virginia and they uh, involved a different set of people. Uh, the mechanism that brought them here was interesting because what happens is that the King of England or whoever the railing monarch was at the time, uh, technically owned all of the British claimed lands in America, which extended uh, in sort of a un, un, uh, resolved way into the Western part clear to what they basically had heard about as far as the Mississippi River was concerned. And that was the, the British claim. But the British claim was uh, interesting because the king, in order to raise money, usually to fight some kind of war or whatever, uh, would sell off his property and give grants to nobles uh, to, uh, to 
gain their favor and, and maintain his political position as king of, the, of England. And so the, the land that was here was basically a, a land that was out there for development as far as the, the people who received it, received it were concerned. They didn't view America as being a place for religious liberty or escape from tyranny or anything else. Uh, all they viewed it was uh, it had some value and they could sell it. And so when we when I mentioned land developers at the beginning, uh, if you get into the land development history of the United States and you begin to look at the Massachusetts Bay Company and the Virginia Company and these other uh, companies that were formed in England to uh, sell land in the uh, in America, then you you begin to understand that almost everything that happened in America had had was directly related to uh, land development and, and real estate sales. The people who came to the, on the Mayflower, for example, when they landed in Massachusetts, had landed in the wrong place. They were supposed to land further south in the Virginia Company. Uh, they were aiming for uh, the area around Long Island in New York, which they missed by quite a bit and ended up in Massachusetts. And so for, for the first year, they were, in a sense, you would call them squatters. They were people who were living on land that they did not own and had no right to. And it was only after, after different boats went back and forth and they negotiated a, a different deal and with the formation of the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Bay Company, land company, then they were able to gain any kind of rightful ownership to the property that they were living on. So this is, is a pretty complex thing. And if you think about what I'm saying and in terms of genealogy, then you'll begin to understand that some of the, the records that we want to look at are land records and from the earliest times and that, that these records are generally available online, some in the, uh, in the towns and, and uh, counties of New England, yes. So except for those few that have been lost or whatever, but the land records themselves are, um, are the basis for understanding who got the land first, who got the land second, and if we understand the, the, the laws of inheritance as they existed back at that time period, you can begin to understand why it's important to understand who the pool of people were at the beginning, who were the first people there, the Mayflower people and the Jamestown people, uh, and we'll just talk about New England, the, that the, the New England people were the people who could um, uh, who were there with the land, and then they began to sell the land off and divide it and do subdivisions. And uh, does it sound like something going on in the United States? Yes, that's kind of the history, folks. And that's exactly what was going on here. So we have passenger lists. We have um, the land records. We have diaries, journals, letters, manuscripts, um, censuses that were taken, and immediately we have tax records because this land was still considered part of, of Great Britain and uh, they weren't about to let people live tax-free any place. And so there were tax records and real estate tax records. And as you go through the New England town records where the most of these records were kept, the uh, it's it's pretty easy to see when people leave to go someplace else because they vanish off the tax list. And uh, then it's up to the researcher to find out where they went. Uh, so this is the this is kind of the background, the idea of, of what what was happening over here. Um, if you're thinking in terms of uh, uh, the, the the great a deal of information that has been created about the Puritans and about the way they looked and the way they dressed and the way they, what they did and how they lived, uh, then you're probably buying into a, um, 
a kind of manufactured story, I hate to tell you this, but manufactured story that started uh, clear back uh, right after they arrived, as a matter of fact. And the, this uh, statue here of, of Samuel Chapin is an example because uh, the way that they were dressed here with the high hats and the, and the breeches and all that was uh, probably not consistently way, the way the people dressed at that period of time. So the ones who of the Puritans who did become Congregationalists, beginning with the Cambridge Platform of 1648, uh, became regarded as a religious con uh, as the religious constitution of Massachusetts. And that became, in a sense, the state religion of Massachusetts. And uh, so if somebody didn't agree with that and, and came to Massachusetts, uh, what happened to them? Well, they left. And that's why we had people going into other colonies with more, um, uh, let's call it expansive views of religious freedom uh, such as Rhode Island and uh, to some extent Connecticut. And so the re people who came to those other colonies uh, later were, were the people who were, uh, let's say, not particularly welcome in Massachusetts. So this is a kind of a different, uh, the way that the law lurks and everything that you, when you're doing your research in, La in New England, these are the kinds of things that you need to know. Did your family come from, from uh, Rhode Island? If they came from Rhode Island, their, their religious background and their, uh, what they, how they lived subsequently and where they went subsequently is tremendously different than if they came from Massachusetts. And if they came from, uh, if, you're, if you're able to trace your families back to uh, New Hampshire and Vermont and and uh, some of the other the other uh, New England states, then basically you are uh, that's 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 where your line comes from. And uh, uh, the fact is that uh, with the intermarriages, however, as I've mentioned already, it's very very possible that some of your family lines may entirely go back to these uh, to to this this group of people. Okay, so. Here's a, kind of a graphic of the streams of, of uh, immigration from England, the people who left England to come to America between 1620 and 1642. Um, you'll see that a, a significant number of them, if you look at this carefully, went to the islands, uh, the Caribbean islands. Uh, obviously, somewhere back in England, someone told them, that living in Massachusetts was a lot harder than it was to go to St. Kitts or, or uh, St. Croix or Bermuda or, or Barmuda or someplace or Antigua porque, because that would have been, uh, 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 it would have been much easier to, uh, to, to live and have a, a lifestyle down there in the Caribbean to some extent. Uh, there were some advantages to Massachusetts and that was that they were that there were resources there that were not readily available to those people who went to the to the Caribbean, but uh, you can see there were there were a significant number that went to to Virginia, Maryland, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, uh, Maine, and New Hampshire, and and other places on the on the east. Now, why do we stop at 1641? Because the English Civil War took place from 1642 to 1651. And that caused a steep decline in immigration. People were not leaving England because there was a war going on. Um, and it was not uh, possible for them to get out of England. Um, we may not think in terms of a civil war in England, but there was a great civil war in England and it lasted for uh, quite a long time here, almost 10 years. Now, there are just amazing number of libraries and archives of the records about these early immigrants and their descendants. It, you just have, you, it's hard to comprehend how much information 
is available about these about these families. Uh, it, it is it is just it's just overwhelming. So what you have to do is begin to um, understand the history, the brief kind of things that I've talked about here. And the history of that is that uh, is where you're going to find out what kinds of records were created, where those records may have been kept, and in all the different libraries and archives of this, of this region, which includes, by the way, the university libraries and archives, and the city and county and state archives, and the uh, libraries of the various institutions, including private libraries, and a whole bunch of other types of organizations that have collected these records together. And so it's, it's just overwhelmingly, uh, uh, it's a big task because it's not because there's not enough records, it's because there are a lot of records. But there's one other thing to, to understand, and that is that there, is, there are some organizations that have organized and have these records available. Of course, there are the large online websites, uh, but among those is the most important one is the New England Historic Genealogical Society. And this was the first genealogical society established uh, and it was founded in 1845. Now that's, you can even think 1620 to 1845, 200 and some years, but what you're talking about there is that it was a lot easier when they started in 1845 to find all this information because uh, even though it was almost 200 years, a lot of the people were and their and their ancestors were were well known and uh, finding that information was not difficult. So they began to gather this information, and the New England uh, Historic Genealogical Society. Uh, began collecting all the, as many records as they could find. And so they have a massive amount of records in their, in their library. And, and a great, a huge percentage of those records have been put online and are searchable. Good news. What's the bad news on that one? Well, the good news on that is that American Ancestors is a partner to Family Search. Uh, it, uh, but the other side of the partnership is that this partnership with Family Search only gives access to a limited number of records, and unfortunately, not the records that I talk about today. And so, if you're serious about doing uh, New England research, you need to bite the bullet and become a full member, not a partner member through Family Search, but a full member of the National, of the New England Historic Genealogy Society. And then, uh, and then if you're, and I can say that if your ancestors came from anybody, any place on this map, and in addition, any place that looks adjacent to the map, like New, New York or whatever, you should really focus on uh, doing some, some real research into the records on the uh, NEHJS website. Okay, so I said it's the oldest organization and it began what is called the Great Migration Study Project. And this is under the direction of a person, of a man named Robert Charles Anderson, who is a, uh, a fellow of the American uh, Society of Genealogists. And he was the, put in as director in 1988. And the idea here was to compile a comprehensive genealogical and biological accounts, biograph, excuse me, biographical accounts of the 20,000 or so English immigrants. And so the answer is they did it. That's what they did. They, they plowed through every conceivable record that they could find, every journal, every article, everything that ever happened. And it's a, a fabulous amount of information. And they uh, then compiled this list. And they have published so far this much of it. They published the from 1620 to 1633, 
in three volumes. It's called The Great Migration Begins Immigrants to New England. And it's a book. And uh, by the way, the books are in the, in the uh, BYU Family History Library if you want to look at the book. Uh, if you want to look at it online, uh, in just a moment, I'll explain that, that uh, this information is being digitized and added to the American Ancestors website, which is the website for the New England Historic Genealogy Society. The Great Migration Immigrants to New England from 1634 to 1605 is in three volumes, and it only covers the surnames from A to H. You can see uh, this is kind of an illustration of what happens when you start looking at uh, more, uh, even one year of additional uh, descendants of the original population. It just becomes gigantic. But they, this, this is an ongoing project, and they will begin that process. Uh, they are beginning that process. And then there is a newsletter. That's, uh, being, that's been published for 12 years. All of these uh, are available through uh, that the AmericanAncestors.org website uh, of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Now, there were older compilations of the first settlers. Uh, there's a genealogical dictionary of the first settlers of New England from 1860 to uh, that basically goes back and it was written between 1860 and 1862. There's Austin's Genealogical Dictionary of Rhode Island in 1887 and Pope's Pioneers of Massachusetts in 1900. There's another one, Noyes Libyan Davis's Genealogical Dictionary of Maine and New Hampshire. Uh, the dates here are not the dates that, the, that these uh, documents cover these books cover, they are the dates of which they compiled and the time period in which they were, they were uh, written. So these are very helpful. I have found them to be uh, uh, very accurate to some extent, accurate and um, very informative and a good startup place for looking in these. All of these, various of these are online in different um, forms. So if you take down the name of one of these books and do a Google search for the book, you'll, you'll probably find uh, a, a lot of different places where the information has been, uh, is, is available. Uh, so it's just a generally type of thing that when you, when you get to this point, you're going to be using Google a whole lot to, uh, to keep finding additional resources that, uh, that are available in different libraries and in different formats, some of it online and digital format, some of it in books, some of it in digitized books, and uh, as you keep going. Uh, what you're looking at on this particular one is the uh, famous Plymouth Rock, uh, which has engraved on it 1620. There's quite a history of this. Um, there is a publication that came out in the uh, American Ancestors, most current uh, edition of the American Ancestors magazine. That is, uh, that goes into really a long, it's long article. It's about um, maybe eight or 10, eight or so pages or 10 pages long. And it goes into the entire history of the whole idea of the Mayflower passengers and how it evolved today so that we have pumpkins and, turkeys and people in black hats and women in dresses with lace and things like that, all of that kind of thing and where all that came from. And uh, uh, to understand the pilgrims, and, and this, this is probably, a, a, if you want to be thankful, you would be a pilgrim. Uh, they were thankful people. And why were they thankful? Because they arrived in Massachusetts on November 11th. Go look at the weather today in Massachusetts, and you can see what it's, it would have been like to the, for them to have landed at that point in time. Uh, one of the myths about the pilgrims is that they built log cabins. Well, they didn't build log cabins because they didn't know how to build log cabins. They'd never seen a log cabin, and they didn't even know what the log cabin looked like. 
And so that was not something that they had. They, they, were, they were on their own. They had few resources and most of them lived in the ship. Uh, and during that first winter, uh, about half of them died because it was the severe malnutrition because of, of the, the temperatures and the disease and everything else. And uh, the few that were remaining uh, planted crops and had a fairly good um, harvest and, uh, and, and some substantial help from the Native American population. And yes, they did celebrate and they had a, a celebration and that is what has kind of become the idea um, uh, of, of how these things all work. Okay, so the Great Nimbation Study was from compiled accounts checked against original source materials. So they started out with the lists of all these people and then they checked it against original source material to verify that they were actually part of this group of people that were in there. Now, the advantage to genealogists as you go back is that when you, when you get into the Great Migration Project area uh, and or you get to the Mayflower passengers, you have uh, a substantial number of people who have been documented beyond the normal human capacity to do documentation. So this doesn't mean they just had a few sources, but this means that they were exhaustively uh, researched to the point where each of these people uh, is, is whatever completely. Now, here's the problem that I see this, what, and this is gonna be kind of an, an off different ob observation. When I, I have two passengers on the Mayflower, uh, Francis Cook and Richard Warren. And what happens with these two people is that I get, I have them on my um, follow list. It used to be uh, to uh, whatever, to follow these people. And that means that uh, Family Search sends me a list of the changes to these people every week. And I Usually in a normal week, I will get somewhere around 167 changes on about 20 or 30 people. And about two thirds to three fourths of those will be on the four or five people that are related directly to the May uh, Mayflower. And the, the, I call these people revolving doors because the information just comes in and comes out because basically folks, this is the gold standard. There is no, there is no way that any individual without the support of this kind of an organization could, could do this kind of re research in depth. And the reliability is extremely high. If you find something that you think disagrees with this, you are more than welcome to contact the National Historic Genealogical Society and uh, have them review your, your work. They will be glad to review it and tell you why you, where you were wrong. But uh, that's basically the, the situation here. As far as the Mayflower, there is no controversy. There is no, there are no unfound children. There are no dates that are wrong. There are no dates that are known that, that haven't, that are not, if they're unknown, they're unknown. And if they're known, they're known. There's just, it's just not a, it's a completely uh, resolved area of, of American genealogy. And the fact that people go in there incessantly and make changes and try to add in information that they got through their, uh, their uh, path file or whatever they're using is, is, um, is it's unfortunate because it's a lot of time spent for, by people doing work where that work does not need to be done. And there is no question that all of these people have had their, their um, ordinance work done as far as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints should be concerned. Okay, so the digitized results of the project are on the New England Historic Genealogical Society website, as I've mentioned, AmericanAncestors.org. And this is the website. 
And here's, uh, here's you can specifically search the Great Migration Study. There's, um, there's hundreds of different uh, sets of records on the American ancestor side. And uh, there is a search, and when it talks about the category, you have a long list of categories. You can search one database and specifically, or you can search generally ac across all the records. Uh, I would suggest doing your research and uh, doing specific searches, doing as specific a search as you're able to do given the research you have, because that will be more efficient in working with this particular website, the American Ancestors website. Okay, so here's a, here's a look, search for Francis Cook, 1583 to 1663. And um, so I'm going to search the database of the Great Migration Project. And in my, uh, because the, because the years involved here is the year that he arrived in America uh, in 1620. So that's the year I start doing some research. So this is what happens. So here's Francis Cook in the Great Migration Begins. And it's an immigrant to New England, 1620 to 1633. And it's in volumes one through three. And then his residence was in 1620, which confirms that he was a Mayflower passenger. And his location was Plymouth, Plymouth, Massachusetts, which also confirms that. And it shows you exactly where in the book that information is located, which is on page 467. And so then in going to the book, which you just, which is also on the website, so you just have to click and go look at it. Then you have your image of the, of the book and a transcription of the book. So basically here is the information on Francis Cook. He was, his origin was in Leiden, Holland. He migrated in 1620 and his first residence was in Plymouth. Um, so for example, here with, with Francis Cook, um, we have no information about his parents. Zero, zilch, nothing. Hundreds, uh, over a hundred years of research by people who have spent literally fortunes on researching these people have been unable to find Francis Cook's parents. So this is this is just a reality, um, and I'm not discouraging anyone because there's it's always there's always that possibility, but I'm I would suggest that that possibility is probably uh, a difficult one because many of these people changed their names to avoid the persecution from the Church of England in England. So his name may not have been Francis Cook when he was in England and when he moved to Leiden. So from that reason alone, it, it, it starts to become very difficult. But here we have enough information to establish the identity of his wife, uh, who, who was a, a Walloon. And um, there was also, uh, there's also documentation on all of his children and there are no extra children that uh, have not been found. Okay, so here's as here's his, uh, much information to get you started. Now, we've got a lot more to do. You've got the image of the page, you have a citation here, which is quite long. You have a description of the page of what where this volume came from. And in addition, they're gonna give you down in the right-hand corner um, tips on how to search or watch a vid video on search or guides to using the database and uh, how to learn from their experts. So there's, there's a lot of information. You'll notice that volumes one through three up here at the top of the page, uh, this is page 467 as, we, as I mentioned, there are 2,386 pages in those three volumes. So this is, this is a, a substantial work. Uh, 
here's an here's a uh, enlarged version of that part that talks about you're going to get the same kinds of information about each of the people who were the subjects of uh, the great migration study here's some of the um, uh, the original records um, most of the valuable records in the early days, even up until the almost the present time for New England is, is contained in the town registers, in the town records. And you can go on to, for example, the familysearch.org website and look in the catalog and search through a place in New England and find uh, out if they happen to have a digitized copy of the town records. Good news. They do then what? Well, they are not indexed. Um, they are chronologically written by the town in the town records. And so you need to start uh, searching these records by getting the earliest one that might apply to your family name, the person you're looking for and then uh, research it line by line and go through and look and see if you can find a mention of that particular person. Now, what happens when you do that? Well, the gold mine, for example, and doing that and sitting there in the library for days and days and reading the town records in Hopkinton, Rhode Island for me was the fact that I found uh, John Tanner's birth, birth record. John Tanner was my sixth generation back great grandfather. And um, he was, well, he's famous as being the one who joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints, at least among those of his descendants. And uh, up to that point in time, as far as all the records that I have observed in all of the books that are published and everything, no one had ever had actually found that exact, that particular record of his birth and the, and the record of his siblings and his parents get marriage. So um, this is the kind of thing that uh, the value of these records and the incentive for spending the time to work through them page by page. So it very important as you work backwards in time through your generations to make sure you have a valid supportable source for each parent and child relationship. You know, this is not a situation where uh, you simply jump back and begin researching in New England. You begin in wherever you lived in California or Nevada or Texas or Mississippi and you trace it back and then uh, if you find that you're related to these people in New England, then you have this opportunity. If you're, if you're, um, if it happens that you have lines uh, like I do, for instance, where multiple people in my lines came from New England, uh, then this is, it's a, it's a different thing because I knew very early on that my people were from New England because they were there in uh, the records and I was related to them. So this is, this is kind of the situation where you get into that. Um, so here's, for instance, a screenshot of part of my um, family tree on the part I have on the family search family tree. And you can see down in the right, lower right, that there's Francis Cook and Richard Warren, and they are uh, and they have uh, uh, various information listed, uh, some of which is correct and some of which is not because it depends on which day of the week it has been changed and someone has added in a parent or a family or whatever for these people that does not exist. So, but basically um, uh, that's one thing. Now, if, you, if it's the Mayflower is, is probably more the draw uh, the rest of the New England people, you just have to remember that there's these tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions and millions of people who are related to these people. And some of them are genealogists and they're all going to have their own little agenda and their own thing. So uh, putting it all here in the family tree 
uh, you're going to see a lot of changes to these people. And so this is an area where uh, you kind of reserve it until you have enough uh, experience and intestinal fortitude to face uh, that kind of a, a lot of, of changes in to the information. If you're wondering about what to do about changes, uh, we have a number of videos uh, on the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel that address the issue of changes as and what how you should view the changes and what to do about them uh, on the Family Search Family Tree. So, when you do a general search on the Mayflower Society, uh, you you may find other relatives or ancestors on some of the other websites. This one is the General Society of Mayflower Descendants, which is known as the Mayflower Society. And they have uh, a huge database of information uh, that's called the Silver Books. The Silver Books are every Mayflower passenger documented down five generations. And uh, those are available, and those are also on the American Ancestors web website, as are town records and tax records and every other kind of record, land and property records, and a lot of other records about New England that, uh, that are available. And I must mention again that you may also want to search on Ancestry, Family Search, and uh, re recall that. Uh, Find My Past is the British is a British company and has a, a British records. And remember that this was New England and it was part of Great Britain. And you might want to search on Find My Past because they may have some of the records that you're looking for. So there's a lot of places out there to start. And this is, uh, this is a good indication of what kinds of things that you'll find. Now, that what I'm saying is only partly part of the story. Most of the lines have been researched to some extent uh, back in this early time period. What hasn't been researched are their descendants. There are not, uh, when even if you come five generations down from 16, the 1600s, that only keeps you in the fifth in the 1700s, and there's hundreds of thousands of their descendants that are waiting out there to be found. So this is a uh, a great work, and it's a great opportunity because these are marvelous resources. Okay, well, thanks for watching.